Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Doc Talk with Monument Health. My name is Mark Houston, and joining me again is Dr. Ali Zakaria, board certified gastroenterologist and hepatologist physician, also trained in advanced interventional endoscopy. Now, last time, doctor, we talked to you was episode 64, I believe. And we discussed uh, interventional endoscopy in patients with altered anatomy, yep. which was fascinating and uncomfortable for me <laughs> to hear a lot of that. But uh, still, I would encourage people to go back and listen to that episode, too, uh, for sure. But today, um, and, I, and I first off, want to say thank you for the blue ribbon. I didn't know this was a thing yeah. uh, to start, but like there are pink ribbons for breast cancer, there are blue ribbons for colon cancer. Uh, and that's kind of what we're going to focus on today. Uh, and I know in a, in a future episode, we're also going to talk with your wife, who is an oncologist, who also deals with this as well. Um, so you're the doctor, though, that we see first, correct? Yeah. When something is just a little off or we feel like we should get checked, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me again. You I'm bet. I'm really excited to be here one more time to talk about these kind of, you know, uh, topics that is pretty common, but we still have kind of lack of awareness or resistance from the population to hear about it because it's they're amazing concerned. They we don't want to hear about cancer. They right. just wanna, well, I don't want to hear about it. You know? That's true. I just try to kind of ignore it or, you know, just avoid it. But I think it's very important to come and bring this awareness. And I will tell you, since I joined Monument in July 2022, that, <clears throat> you know, colon cancer awareness came into my attention right away. And in, in, in last year, in, in March, which is March, is actually the Colon Cancer Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the whole thing, the whole project that I've been working on with the great job from Monument Health team helping me building this awareness in the community, is that I noticed that there is this lack of awareness. Um, and then I came up with, okay, we need to do more about this. You know, we talked about pancreatic cancer because I've noticed there is a lot of pancreatic cancer in the community. Mm -hmm. And now... March is a colon cancer awareness month, and, and colon cancer is the third, you know, most common diagnosed cancer in males and the second in females. So it's a very common cancer, oh boy. and we really need to know about it. So I was like, we need to do some more awareness for people to know what we can do, what we can offer them. And, you know, I work with the Monument Health, and we're doing a big campaign in, 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 in this year, and I'm so happy with the collaboration between the whole teams and from the cancer care center, the GI department, the administration to make this a real thing. And, and hopefully it will turn out, you know, as positive as they want it to right. be. And this is the, you know, the podcast that is like the first step in getting us into this March awareness uh, or colon cancer awareness March uh, month. Uh, absolutely. Now, you um, are you surprised uh, before we kind of get into to generally um you know, your role in colon cancer. Have you been surprised? Because I think what's taken a lot of people um, aback, I guess, recently over the last year or so, are all of these stories that are coming out about colon cancer being found in younger and younger people right yeah. now. Was that surprising to you when you started to see these studies too? I mean, relatively, yes. But we have seen this even in, in our practice. And that's what led to the studies, right? Okay. We see more. We do more. Because... I will tell you back in, 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 in maybe 10 years ago, when we used to see a young patient who comes in with a rectal bleeding or blood in the stool, we would say that most probably this is hemorrhoid. I don't think we need to do a colonoscopy. You're a low risk. Why we should, do, should we do that? And then we start doing these procedures because the bleeding persists. And then we were kind of surprised either by having a advanced adenoma, which is a polyp that can mm -hmm. become a cancer, or um, cancer. So, well, then we you know, start looking to this observation more and more till we did a more kind of official studies. Right. And the guidelines got updated where a lot of societies, American Cancer Society, American, Ca you know, College of Gastroenterology, the United um, State, you know, Preventive uh, Task Force updated their recommendation that we should start early. And always when we talk about screening, we weigh the risk and benefit. Mm -hmm. Is it more risk to do a procedure or the benefit outweigh the risk and we should do the procedure? And we found that a younger age group, and we will talk about that in details, will actually benefit from doing this procedure. There is like, you know, um, benefit of offering screening. And, and that's where it comes from because it started as observation, became right. an official study and more, you know, a thorough uh, examination of the situation. And we saw that. And we noticed that <clears throat> what we call it early onset colon or colorectal cancer, that's mm -hmm. like EOCRC. It's a new term that we see, which is a patient-developed colon cancer younger than the age of 50. 
So that is when this become a big thing. We start looking at the risk factors for those patients, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we found that, you know, the colon cancer count of mortality um, in individual under the age of 50 declined by 2% over the years between 2000 and 2004. However, we noticed that there is an increase by 1% annually since, you know, through 2018, and that increase was limited to white and Hispanic population. So that increase in the incidence of mortality in young population was noticed more in white population. So mm-hmm. that, you know, also directed our kind of approach for those patients. Right. Because in general, colon cancer is more common on black Americans or African Americans. But the younger generation, less than or early onset colon cancer, is noticed to be more common in white uh, population. Okay. So that's again some something goes to the uh, you know the epidemiology and and you know the racial difference and and, and and this and that. In 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 our state and in our you know area where we have almost twenty five to thirty percent Native Americans, mm-hmm. those are second in line after Black Americans or African Americans are Native Americans and, and Alaskan uh, Americans who are high risk for colon cancer. Right. So that's why when I came in, I was like, we really need to bring this attention and, and, and make sure that those patients get the best care that we can offer them. So now that, let, well, let's get into this awareness then, doctor. Let's mm-hmm. let's get started with, with risk factors mm-hmm. for colorectal cancer, okay? Um, what should you be looking for? Yeah, so as I said, like just number-wise, so people, they understand that <clears throat> Globally, across the, the, the globe, the, the, color, the colon cancer is the third in, in males and, and the second in females. And we, <clears throat> in the United States, we get almost 153,000 new cases of colon cancer per year. 100,000 or 107,000 colon cancer and almost 46,000 rectal cancer. And there is a little bit difference of between rectal and colon cancer, and I will leave that to Dr. Al Sharay to talk a little bit more about it in yes. her podcast because she will provide you know the treatment and the options and, and all of this. But this is real. I mean, 150,000 cases per year is a lot of cases, and and, and that's why we get this diagnosis as a diagnosis that will benefit from screening. Mm-hmm. Um, the death rate has in general decreased because there is more you know. Screening colonoscopies, more procedures being done. We are catching those at early stage and we treat them. So the mortality has been decreasing, except, as I said, for the young population, we will notice a little bit of increase in white and Hispanic individuals. So risk factors. <clears throat> the way that I personally look at the risk factors for colon cancer is, is I will separate it in, in, in two ways. Mm-hmm. The first way, which is what we just talked about, which is early onset colon cancer in patients less than 50 year old. We, I look at those as a special population. And then I look at the general population. What is the risk factor for them? And even for the general population, I look at the risk factor as, are those risk factors going to change my screening recommendation? Are they might change my screening recommendation or they have no effect on my screening recommendation? So that will make it more, you know, more sense of it when I present it to the patient. So for early onset colon cancer, we notice that those are it can be a sporadic, meaning that you can get it without any family history or inherited, you know, polybosis syndrome. And the way that colon cancer happen is the most common theory is that adenoma carcinoma sequence. You have a normal colon, then the mucosa become adenoma or a precancerous change. The adenoma can change to adenoma with high grade dysplasia, and then eventually cancer. That takes a long time to happen. It takes up to ten years. Why? So it why, doesn't happen overnight. Why is why is it such a slow moving cancer? It are depends. You, you Some of them are faster, right? Okay. If you have a predisposition, but generally, it's generally yeah, it's okay. slow growing, and and, and 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 that's what we notice, and that's why our screening and surveillance recommendation changes to adapt this more understanding of this process. Okay. So, if we looked at patient who comes in with family history of colon cancer, a strong family history that will raise the suspicion of genetic predisposition. Mm-hmm. We call it genetic, you know, inherited uh, polybosis syndrome. I will give two big examples where, where like familial adenomatous polybosis, where you have a gene mutation in APC gene. And we do have people in the community who does have gene mutation like this, and they oh. come in to see us in our clinic. And we do very strict early on, very young age start, and then annual colonoscopy. And some of those will actually require removing all of their colon to prevent colon cancer from happening because they will get colon cancer if they don't do that. And then Lynch syndrome, which is a non-polybosis or uh, uh, hereditary non-polybosis colorectal cancer where you don't really have that much of polyps, 
but you you'll get colon cancer. Mm-hmm. And this is the most common one in those young age. So when we screen those patients and see that they have a strong family history of colon cancer, endometrial cancer, pancreas, or Lynch defining cancers, we pay more attention to them. Right. Then we do either the family pedigree and then we do genetic testing, confirm mm-hmm. it, and then we put them in the screening and surveillance program that they require. And those actually account for almost 35% of patients who comes in with early onset colorectal cancer, which is almost one third, which means that there's a lot of other non-hereditary polyposis, sporadic cases that comes with colon cancer. And the risk for those, again, if you remember, we talked about obesity, never yes, good for you. Right, of course. Obesity is always not good. <laughs> Metabolic <laughs> syndrome, you know, hypertension, coronary artery disease, all of these things will increase your risk. Alcohol s- consumption can increase your risk, especially in young age. I will mention something now, and I will talk a little bit about it down the road, which is the lack of regular use of NSAIDs. I will tell you, you will never hear a gastroenterologist telling you take NSAIDs, ibuprofen, Motrin, because they harm kidneys, they harm your stomach, they can cause bleeding, they can cause ulcers. But there is some data about protective rule of aspirin and NSAIDs in patients with specific NSAIDs in patients with, uh, you know, to decrease the risk of colon cancer. Right. But this is something that we notice. Vitamin D deficiency. Everyone is having vitamin, mm-hmm. low vitamin D. Right. Insufficient, <laughs> deficient, yeah. and, and we're not as good. And now we are getting more attention from the family practice and the primary care physician to replace vitamin D right away. Mm-hmm. We notice that low vitamin D has been associated with, you know, or, you know, linked with increased risk of colon cancer. Okay. Other factors, inflammatory bowel disease. You might hear the term Crohn's disease mm-hmm. or ulcerative colitis, this chronic inflammatory process, especially someone who has ulcerative colitis, pancolitis, the whole colon is inflamed, that increases the risk of, of you know, colon cancer significantly, almost 15 folds, because that inflammation is just yeah. affecting the cells nonstop. Same thing with Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease can affect mouth to anus. So if it's affecting more than one third of the colon, your risk of colon cancer will be high. So you need special surveillance, early onset, and all of this. And that's what we do in these patients. We document how many times you know we did colonoscopy. We went to start the proper surveillance and how often you do it based on the findings. <clears throat> so that's generally what we talk about. You know, family history of inherited polyposis, family history of colon cancer, and 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 high risk adenomas, and then the rest of you know environmental factors. Mm-hmm. If we want to move to the general population, yeah. not the early onset colon sure. cancer, just general population. Yes. So I look at is it. I look at the, the risk factor as is this is going to affect my screening program? Am I going to offer the screening at a younger age? The most important part was the age, right? Mm-hmm. Age change. We used to say if you're 50, you go for colonoscopy. Now it's 45. Right. So if you're 45, it's time to visit me or visit <laughs> a, your gastroenterologist. Yes. <laughs> it's or your primary care to do a screening colonoscopy. Right. Visit yes. someone to talk about screening colonoscopy. And then, same thing, hereditary colon cancer, all of these FAP or familial adenosine polyposis, Lynch syndrome, all of these are Mm -hmm. also risk factors that will increase your risk of colon cancer and as an average uh, population. Family history of colon cancer, we used to say that, oh, my cousin had it, my, my aunt had it, you know, distant family relatives. No, the family that matters in this particular Family matters always. Right, of course. In this particular <laughs> uh, disease is actually first degree relatives. Is immediate. Relatives. Yep. Okay. Parent, siblings, child, those are the first degree relatives. Okay. Those will increase your risk of colon cancer, especially if anyone had it before the age of 50. So that will increase your risk, and that will, by at least two folds, and it will put you at a earlier start date for your screening and more robust surveillance afterward, even if you have a normal colon. Mm-hmm. If you have a family, sometimes you don't have a family history of colon cancer, but you have a family who had advanced adenoma or a high-risk polyp. So we describe those polyps to a low-risk and high-risk. A high-risk polyp is a polyp that is more than 10 millimeter or one centimeter, half an inch, a polyp that is with high-grade dysplasia or a tubular villus adenoma. This is like more medical terms, but those are high-risk polyps. So those high-risk polyps increase the risk of the patient himself or herself, and then the first degree relatives should be aware of this and should be screened at earlier stage and maybe they will require more robust again Mm -hmm. or frequent surveillance. Same thing with the inflammatory bowel disease that will affect your start date and how often do we do your procedure. Right. Things that may influence the (coughs) recommendation, again, the age we said that we usually recommend 45 so it truly affects the start date and then 
the race and the sex and all of these things, we just mentioned that, you know, white have a higher risk of mortality at early mm -hmm. or young age, but that doesn't really affect. We're not going to be selective, only screen, you know, white population before they right. age. We're going <laughs> to screen everyone. Right. Or, you know, males has a higher risk of colon cancer, so do more males than females. No. It's across the board. So mm -hmm. we know that they are having a higher risk, but that's not going to affect our recommendation. So it's a risk, but it's not going to affect who should screen. So okay. I pay less attention to that because you should know about it, but it's not going to affect you as a person or as a, as a patient to get your screening done. Very few kind of random things. I'm just going to throw it there. Pa patients with acromegaly, like, you know, they have a growth hormone that is abnormally excreted. They have like, you know, gigantic face, bone, this. The recommendation from their society, once you get the diagnosis, you got to get your colonoscopy because the growth hormone will increase your risk of colon cancer. Patients who get kidney transplant and they are on immunosuppressive therapy, they have a higher risk of colon cancer. That's not going to affect when to start or how often do you do it, but we saw that there is some association with a higher risk in those population. Things that do not affect your screening recommendation. So there is no effect on the screening recommendation is, again, obesity, mm -hmm. metabolic syndrome, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, and, and, of course, diet. And I know that a lot of people, they will talk nonstop about diet. What diet should I take? What diet should I, I take? What's the diet that, you know, will increase my risk or not? I think the protective diet can be defined for clinical purposes to include avoidance of processed and mm -hmm. charred meat, like barbecue, all of these kind of things, and then inclusion of vegetables and fruit. That's yeah. the best advice. Take a lot of VG and, and, and fruits in your diet. Well, fiber must be pretty important with yes. this, isn't it? Yes. Because fibers, it seems we hear more and more about how important that is now, yes. too. Yes. Fibers is very important. That's why we recommend veg vegetables mm -hmm. and, 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 and you know fruits. And then adequate amount of folate intake through your diet, not folate, you know, supplements, right. and then eventually limit your calories so you avoid, con mm -hmm. you know, obesity and, 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 you know, high calorie intake and avoidance of excessive alcohol use. Right. So that's the diet, if you want to put it in a one sentence. Okay. I just actually put it exactly, and I'm reading Very it Very simple, exactly yes. It is. <laughs> um, so those are the risk factors and the way that I look at it. <clears throat> and I think your follow-up will become, okay, so how I can, you know, protect myself from right. colon cancer. If there is all of these risks, some of them I can change, some of them I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't change my genes. And I, can, I mean, now you can change, you know, you cannot change your age. Right. Now, you know, <laughs> those things are things that you cannot change. You right. can feel good about it. Yes. Like, I feel young. I feel 30. You exactly. Know, like I feel, you know, 20. <laughs> uh, but things that can actually protect you. Be active. You know, physical activity for multiple purposes. It is going to enhance your cardiovascular kind of situation. It's going to protect you from coronary artery disease. It's going to mm -hmm. improve your blood pressure. It's going to improve your weight and obesity. So physical activity is a good advice. The diet, as I just mentioned, monitor what you eat, eat more veggies, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, fruits and, and vegetables. Right. Um, we noticed that folate, B6, vitamin D, calcium associated with a protective factor, but don't overkill it. Moderate amount, make sure that you have the enough intake from mm -hmm. your food to supply this. And low magnesium, we found that higher magnesium can be linked to, and all of this like observational study does not have a strong, you know, uh, evidence base around it. It's just an observation that we noticed. And then coffee, fish, garlic, again, associated with good outcome or, you know, in right. general, like protective effect in, in, in certain observational small volume studies. You say coffee yeah. can be so, yeah, filtered protective. Coffee, yeah, it can be protective. And again, that's what we noticed. But again, everything in moderation. So I'm not going to. Of gonna, course. Oh, right. So I'm, right. you know, if I now drink I a cup of coffee pots. now, like, you know, start <laughs> drinking. You know, it's right. like, you know, coffee in general for the GI tract is very protective. You know, a one cup of filtered coffee for liver, for colon. There is some observational studies that notice that. Again, are those strong evidence-based primary, you know, right. controlled, you know, blind, double-blind controlled studies? No, but those are just observational mm -hmm. studies. And it's difficult to do these studies in, in, in general. But as I said, it's, it has some protective rule and in, mod in, in, in moderation is, is, is advisable. And the last thing is that the aspirin and NSAIDs, long-term use, there was a study that showed that if you take aspirin regularly, baby, baby aspirin, 81 milligram, and you're going to take it for 10 years, that's when we start seeing the difference. So it's not taking aspirin for like a few weeks, 10 weeks, 10 months. That would have been 10 my next years question. When we start yeah. seeing the effect of protection from aspirin. So that's we usually we say that, okay, I'm not going to prescribe it primarily to prevent mm -hmm. you from getting colon cancer. However, if you need it for other reasons, we notice that, well, the benefit will cover you for, you know, protection, some protection from colon cancer. Right. But, the, you know, the post-hoc analysis and all of the studies for that particular study about NSAIDs and aspirin found that the long-term use of aspirin 
for 10 years when we start seeing this, you know, protective effect. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but I just mentioned that briefly because I don't want to yeah. teach because they w- you would be surprised that if I go in and say, like, oh, you get to take aspirin and say, they would say that, I don't think you are truly a gastroenterologist. <laughs> Usually gastroenterologists say, don't take right. these medications. <laughs> this is the fight between the cardiologist and the gastroenterologist. <laughs> Stop antiplatelets, take antiplatelets. Not good yes. for kidneys, not good for your stomach. <laughs> but you know, take it when it's needed or indicated. Sure. And if we can get that added benefit of it, then excellent, we got it. Well, doctor, um, I think if anybody has listened to this podcast and has any questions, I would be very surprised, okay? (laughs) You have done an excellent job of explaining all of this right now. And, of course, the main thing to take away from this today for sure is get screened. Yeah. Right? The best test is the test that you do as instructed. That is great advice. I keep telling my wife, and I'm going to say it one more time, is that if you see me, you're not going to see her, hopefully. (laughs) So see me so you don't see her. She's a cancer doctor. If you you don't want to see a cancer doctor, come and see us. Or see your primary care to do a screen. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Ali Zakaria, thank you so much for coming in and talking again. You're welcome anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.